All right. Hello, everyone. So we're back again with uh, another live stream from uh, our lab at in Holland in Delft. And uh, today we have a special guest for the second time, uh, Mr. Piet Lammertje, standing uh, on the right side of me, left for you at home, of course. Um, and Mr. Piet Lammertje will explain you something about a certain topic which is very important in aircraft design. The design of inlets and outlets, is that uh, the right way to approach it, uh, Pete? I suppose so, yeah. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> I am very much... in between. <laughs> or something in between. I am very much looking forward to, uh, to whatever you have to say. Uh, I think your lecture will last for about uh, 45 minutes or so, is that uh, so. roughly the time? Yeah. Yep. Which means there's some time to ask uh, questions. Um, um, and uh, Mark Omert, who is sitting on my left, uh, you can see him right now, but uh, he will come back to you at the end of the presentation and together with uh, uh, Pete and Mark, they will uh, answer all the questions that you have. So please use the chat function uh, using YouTube um, uh, such that we can uh, appropriately address your questions. So having said that, uh, Pete, the floor is yours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll probably get the first slide now, right? Yes, you will. Uh, okay, um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, cooling. And this is especially interesting for the uh, Dragonfly project for in Holland, who are planning to do an electrical motor for a, what was originally an air-cooled uh, aircraft. And so there will be some changes uh, and it's been an inter interesting journey for me to explore this because cooling is actually a very difficult and arcane subject. Uh, but it is important. Um, if you look at uh, the typical airplane, then uh, cooling probably accounts for approximately 15% of the total drag of the airplane. And that is quite a lot. Uh, if you consider uh, what you would have to do to the wing or the fuselage or whatever of an airplane to get a 15% increase in range or in uh, <coughs> endurance, uh, it would make a totally different airplane. So if you can gain something like this, and it's said that you could easily uh, go from 15% to 5% with very careful design, you would gain 10% on the whole airplane and, you know, uh, almost for free. Well, not entirely for free. We'll see that in a minute. So this, uh, this drag, it's made up of drag of the, the air inlet, the intake, uh, of the heat exchanger inside, if it's a liquid uh, uh, motor, uh, mo mo cooler, and otherwise it's the engine itself. Then there is the outlet, and last but not least, a cooler also has an outside shape. It's usually a bulge on the airplane, which has a drag of its own. So there is a main distinction uh, between aircraft engines, between air-cooled and liquid-cooled. Air-cooled looks like this. Usually it's for bigger airplanes, it's a radial engine. For smaller airplanes, it's a boxer engine. Uh, it's a big hole at the front, and then the air goes between the fins of the, of the cylinders of the, of the uh, motor, and then out at the back, and that's it. Liquid cooled, in principle, it's more efficient. Uh, the engines last longer. Uh, they can be more highly strung. Uh, but the cooling is more complicated. You see on this airplane alone, you see like three or four coolers. And we'll get into that later. Uh, the funny thing is that, uh, especially during the Second World War, which was actually the last time that this stuff was developed in any uh, big form, um, the Americans had air-cooled engines and the Europeans had liquid-cooled engines. So you will find that if you go from air-cooled to liquid-cooled, you go from American references to German, basically German references uh, of the Second World War. First we have to talk a bit about Bernoulli. Uh, you should all be very familiar with Bernoulli. Uh, but I'll talk about him uh, anyway. Uh, there is a thing called a venturi, and that is like a throat in a channel. What happens is, 
inside the throat, you know, the layman would expect that uh, there is uh, like a sort of a, a restriction, so there must be more, more pressure there. The reverse is true. Uh, in order for air to flow into that channel uh, throat, uh, it has to be accelerated, so there has to be a bigger pressure behind it. So the air has to be a, at a lower pressure inside the restriction, and after that it has to slow down, so it has to go to a higher pressure. That is totally unexpected to most people, uh, but it's a fact of life, and, and if, you, if, if it grows on you, you know, uh, it, it, uh, at some point it becomes completely natural that things should be this way. So, for instance, take a simple open wind tunnel. Uh, this is basically a Venturi. So, at the start, it has like a nice curved entry, which is called a contraction, uh, and it has sort of like a smooth S shape. Then you get the measurement section, which is the business part, and it's totally straight because you hope to have like uh, a normal atmosphere flow there. And then behind, there is this diffuser to, to go back to atmospheric pressure. Uh, and that is a very long thing. Uh, because, as it turns out, it's very difficult to get air to flow uh, to a higher pressure. Especially, it's very difficult to get a boundary layer to flow to a higher pressure. So contractions are easy, because they go from low, high pressure and they go to low pressure, and boundaries layers love that, you know. Uh, they are pushed ahead by the pressure difference, and uh, so they keep flowing. Even though they're almost stationary, they are pushed towards the exit, and, uh, and, and they love that. Diffusers, on the other hand, are hard. Um, in a closed-circuit wind tunnel like this, you see that there is like a contraction just to the left of the building where the uh, measurement section is. It's a very short part of the, uh, of the whole wind tunnel. The whole rest of the wind tunnel is a diffuser uh, with roughly 7%, 7 degrees uh, expansion along the whole length. It takes like, you know, 90% of the length of the wind tunnel to get back to full pressure. It's that difficult uh, to flow against uh, a pressure increase for a boundary layer. Now, let's have a look at a basic cooler. A basic cooler looks like this. And this is the opposite of a wind tunnel. You have this, this low velocity and consequently high pressure thing in the middle, which is the, uh, the heat exchanger. Uh, and that's a very draggy thing. Then, ahead of that, you have a diffuser, but it's a very short one, so that's very difficult. And aft of the uh, heat exchanger, you have the contraction, and that's the easy part. So, why? Why would we, you know, make it so hard on ourselves uh, to make a channel like this? Well, the, the reason is that uh, radiators uh, by themselves uh, are very draggy things. Uh, they are, in fact, they have fine, you know, uh, plates between them and where the air flows, and it's a, a massive amount of drag. Uh, like, if you put a thing like this into a channel and you don't let the air escape, then you will find that the pressure drop uh, through this uh, radiator is on the order of, well, three to ten times half rho v squared, which you know from the uh, Bernoulli's law. So, it's massive. Uh, the airplane would hardly fly if that actually happened. But it doesn't, because the second problem is that if you have something hanging out in the airstream like this, the air will not uh, even go through it. It will consider this like, uh, like a big uh, you know, traffic sign, and it will just pass around the outside of the heat exchanger. So you have massive drag, and you have almost no cooling. So, so we need to do something. Well. What we need to do is this, and I guess that this is probably the central slide of this whole presentation. Uh, I could talk about this one for an hour, uh, but I won't do that. I will show you uh, a number of important things. Like to the left, you see that there is this narrow thread of air coming on, and it's at full speed. 
then it's sort of slowed down by the lip, uh, by the by the diffu by the uh, diffuser coming on, uh, and it already slows down ahead of the uh, entrance. Then inside the entrance, it slows down more, and at the pressure graph uh, at the bottom, you see that. The blue part is the dynamic uh, pressure, so that's basically uh, the velocity squared. And you see that uh, that goes down to almost nothing at the radiator. And then after that, it speeds up a little more, uh, but not as much as when it came in. You can see the same thing when you look at the top picture. You see that there is this narrow you know, thread of air uh, flowing in, and at the outlet, there is a bigger uh, uh, diameter. That's because at the outlet, you don't have this full uh, stagnation pressure that you have at the, at the front. At the outlet, you have almost like atmospheric pressure. Uh, it's, it's more like uh, the air flows past, and, and that outlet air will have to go along with it, which doesn't mean that it has the same velocity. Uh, because obviously, since it has a, a larger uh, like a tube uh, size, it's going more slowly, which means that you lost uh, momentum along the way. And it also means that after that, uh, after that outlet, you will have lousy flow, and it will have to mix with the outside air. If there is a boundary layer on the airplane there, it will be shot. And, and so this is a very bad part of the flow. If you look inside the diffuser again on the, uh, on the pressure side, you will see that the, the static pressure, uh, that is increasing. Of course, if you slow down the air like this uh, and, and you, you manage to keep the flow attached, which is a big, uh, a big if, uh, then you will see that that green part is the static pressure. So that will increase in that diffuser, of course, hopefully. Uh, but there is a bit of loss due to boundary, separation, boundary layer separation, and it's in red. So you see that uh, this is from Herner's famous book from 1965, which sort of you know, summarizes all the knowledge that had been acquired during the Second World War and for the first 10 or 20 years after. It shows that it's like a 90% what they call efficiency of the diffuser. There is a bit loss in the boundary layer, but most of that velocity uh, is, is transformed into pressure. Then you go into uh, the heat exchanger itself, and there, of course, you have a big loss. Uh, and after that uh, heat exchanger, uh, you go back to atmospheric pressure. We see the green part tapering down to, well, you know, normal atmospheric pressure. And I, the difference between the blue part at the top of the pressure graph, which is velocity, basically, and, and uh, the uh, static pressure, the, the red part, that's all loss. That's lost forever. Um, so how, how are the numbers? It's like if you look in that inside the, uh, the caption below, which is maybe a bit difficult to read, you'll find that there is a 90% efficiency on that diffuser. Xi core, he says, is seven, which means that uh, it has seven times half rho V squared in pressure loss. But then again, half rho V squared is, of course, much lower than in the outer flow, because he says here that the, uh, the uh, let's say, the, the, s the velocity at the start of the, uh, of the radiator, the heat exchanger, is only a quarter of the uh, of the outside flow. Now do the math. Uh, if it's a quarter, then that means that uh, half rho v squared will be not one over four, but one over sixteen of the outside flow. If we have, if we lose seven times half rho v squared, then we lose seven times one sixteenth of half rho v squared outside, which is like you know more than half, and this is what you see in the graph. You actually see that more than half of what enters the, uh, the uh, inlet, in terms of momentum, is lost. But the good news is that you have this full flow through the radiator, uh, so you have cooling, and you haven't lost 
like half rho v squared times 7 on the full flow, which would be not 40% of half rho v squared, it would be 7 times half rho v squared. So this is the reason why we have heat exchangers in an expanding channel. It's to slow down the air, convert that into pressure, push it through that heat exchanger, and then accelerate it out again because, you know, you can't keep that air forever. So, we start with a diffuser, which is the difficult part of any flow. The basic choice that you have to make is, do we do the diffusion inside, like in a wind tunnel, or do we do it outside, like in a jet engine? Uh, of course, you have this oncoming flow, but most jet engines, they have this round intake with a rounded lip, and almost all of the uh, uh, pressure increase is done ahead of that rounded lip, which means that at the part where you have uh, the first contact between, you know, outside air and the inside channel, you have a brand new boundary layer. And that's nice. Here you see the pressure graph. You see that, you know, ahead of this, uh, of this tube, if you like, you see that the pressure already increases, maybe one or two diameters ahead of that intake, you see the pressure increasing. And then once it's inside that tube, well, it's already at the high pressure and there's not much else that you have to do, basically. Jet engines, they have this, uh, uh, they have this type of inlet, uh, but what you see is that uh, there is an expanding or a contracting or a straight ahead possibility. Like if the jet engine is delivering thrust, uh, you will see that the air is sucked in. If it's at the design point, you see that the air goes more or less straight in. And if it's like blocked, uh, then it diverges ahead of the intake. Well, of course, in a cooler, we don't generate thrust. Uh, so we are in the third condition. Uh, we are uh, having air, well, spilling a bit around that intake. So how much air is spilling around the intake? Uh, that depends. Uh, it should be uh, that inside that tube, we have exactly the amount of flow that we need for the cooling, which is more or less always the same amount of flow, the regardless where we're on the, on the uh, runway or we're climbing or we're at maximum speed, the heat exchanger always needs roughly the same amount of airflow. But of course, outside, it's a different story. Outside, uh, there is at high speed, we don't need to take in much of, we need to take in only a tiny thread of air to fill that uh, diffuser. At, at low speeds, it's different. So the entrance of the, uh, of the tube, uh, it gets various angles of flow. And if you remember the uh, leading edge of a wing, a sharp leading edge of a wing cannot take much difference in angle of attack. And it's the same here. So you need to have a rounded lip at, uh, at the start to prevent, like in the left picture, you see that at high speed, you could have the boundary layer separating on the outside of the cooler. And at low speed, you could have the boundary layer separate on the inside in the diffuser. Uh, basically, the uh, flow is regulated by the way uh, not by, by uh, regulating this inlet, although had, it has been done, uh, but the easy way is to regulate it at the outlet. So you can sort of throttle uh, the flow through the radiator by an out, uh, outlet flap, which we will see later. Um, now, that looks ideal, uh, but it, uh, it, it also looks ideal if you take like half one of those uh, tubes as an inlet, and you say, well, I'll, I'll plug that somewhere on the side of my airplane, at the bottom, at wherever, you know. And uh, I will take like half that uh, tube, I'll split it in half, and in the top picture you see that one streamline goes straight ahead, and the other one is like the outside of the tube. So does that work? Well, no, that doesn't work. Uh, the reason is that on that tube, let's say on the bottom half, you have this nice fresh boundary layer, like we claimed,
but at the top, uh, at the, top uh, the boundary layer on the fuselage already feels that pressure increase, and boundary layers don't like that. Um, so they will separate, which means that like in the bottom picture, you will see like a sketchy separation uh, on the skin of the airplane, even ahead of the uh, intake. And then, you know, half of that, uh, half of that uh, heat exchanger will only see like a bit of a, like a wake or a boundary layer. It will not see flow and it will not cool. So this will give a lot of drag and insufficient cooling. So what do we do? Well, the, the first and obvious thing that we do is we put the intake at the nose. Like this is a Hawker Typhoon. You will see that there is this big like bulge uh, below the nose of the airplane. And inside that bulge, we have the radiator. And you see that from the spinner into the intake, you know, air just flows in. There's no problem. You get clean air. Well, the propeller spoils it a little bit. But this is, of course, the most simple way uh, to do it. On the other hand, you have this big bulge uh, below the airplane. So you will have a lot of outside surface area increase, a lot of drag on that shape. And that is not very great, you know. Actually, they try to do something about that. This is the same airplane, but it looks totally different. And I think it didn't make it past the end of the war, the Second World War, that is. Uh, but it's still being, you know, uh, advocated some time to do it like this, to make it like an air-cooled engine. So you make a hole in the front of the uh, nose. And since there is a spinner on an airplane with a propeller, well, you just make a hole in the spinner. I can see some problems there, but it's, it's still worth a try. Uh, there are more ways to get fresh air. Like this is the De Havilland Mosquito, a wooden airplane. And it has the intakes in the leading edge of the wing. That, of course, also comes with a price in terms of maximum lift, etc. cetera. Uh, but it is a nice way of building the radiator into a place that is there already and which is more or less empty, like the part of the wing ahead of the front spar. This is the Messerschmitt 109. Uh, and this is an interesting airplane. It has seen a lot of development in the Second World War. It started out with this type of cooler, then came that type of cooler, and it ended up with this. And this has main radiators, which we will see later, inside the wing aft of the rear spar. It has a chin oil cooler, which is more or less a bulge on the outside. And it has this horrible inlet, a pitot inlet, uh, to get air into the engine itself, uh, actually into the compressor of the engine. Uh, and that looks really dreadful. Another way. Uh, here you see a big belly radiator. Uh, so this has decent flow probably uh, because the nose is quite pointed and still expanding. So the boundary layer on that part of the nose should be OK. And then just ahead of that cooler, yeah, it will be spoiled. But maybe, you know, just maybe this will work. Uh, but apparently it didn't. Uh, apparently it gave a lot of outside friction. And uh, so they changed it into the, the radiator that you probably all know, uh, which they try to sort of camouflage by making it nice, but which is also a bulge on the outside of the airplane. I mean, if you compare this nice clean nose to this one, uh, then really, you know, then it doesn't become so nice, even with the shark mouth. Um, are there ways to do it by not taking the intake at the front? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, one way is to sort of have the intake stand off from the fuselage wall a little bit. Like maybe you all know the F-16 jet. Uh, it has this standoff. So the intake sort of points into the free air and anything boundary layerish uh, is sort of diverted around that inlet. You see that there is some intake in the boundary layer, there are also small other inlets. Airplanes are a mess that way. This is the most famous example of one of those standoff uh, inlets. Um, this is the Mustang, 
one of the most efficient airplanes from the Second World War. And you see that it has this standoff inlet. And it looks, it, it does have a bulge at the bottom, uh, but not that big of a bulge. We'll get to that. And at the end, you see that it has this flap where you can regulate the flow out of this radiator. Uh, you can retract that flap and you can extend it at low speed, you can retract it at high speed, so that you can always have more or less the same amount of air flowing through uh, the heat exchanger. This is what it looks like on the inside. It's much more complicated than you would think. Actually, they had to do uh, a lot of uh, uh, wind tunnel research because the original version had a bad rumble and it wasn't very efficient. And they put it in the full airplane into a wind tunnel in the US. And they tested for a few days and they came out with a slightly different intake. And that seemed to do the trick. But still, you know, it's quite amazing if you see how sharp this diffuser inside the fuselage is. I mean, the contraction at the rear, I can believe that. Uh, it's it's uh, speeding up so the boundary layer will be okay there. But that contraction on the inside, it's a bit of a mystery, right? Uh, there are other ways. You can bleed off boundary layer, just the boundary layer. It's been done a lot of times. This is a Hawker Hunter, a jet intake. And you see there is this tiny slit uh, which sucks up the uh, boundary layer from the fuselage. So you get more or less fresh air into the jet engine. Uh, the Messerschmitt 109 that I showed you, it's, it's later version, the F version, uh, it had this arrangement. And if you look very closely, you see that there is also a slit uh, on top of the radiator, which takes away the boundary layer. And then again, there is quite a big expansion uh, from the slit of air that goes into, uh, into the inlet uh, and then into the radiator. But at least it doesn't present much of an outside area, you know. The radiator itself is hidden inside the wing, which was empty there anyway. <coughs> and um, so on the outside, you don't have much extra surface area or frontal area uh, from the radiator, which is good. So how do we do that? Uh, apparently, we have not what we just showed like a flat wall and then half a tube below it. But now we have something which also expands on the top. And that looks impossible, right? It looks like it even worse uh, for the boundary layer at, the, at that top wall. And it is. You have to do tricks that way. So how is this possible? How did the Mustang and the Messerschmitt get away with such wide angle diffusers? Well, look at what we think might happen and what they did do before the Second World War. They tried to make a contraction in reverse. So, you know, uh, the air flows into the uh, intake, then it has to sort of expand. And if you uh, follow Bernoulli's law, then you see that even if you consider that blue on the top, that blue channel, it's increasing uh, in diameter or in, in size anyway. So the pressure will rise, and this will happen all along that, uh, that radiator, also on the boundary layer on the wall. If we look at the bottom, we see an extra, an extra effect, because the air doesn't go straight ahead, like, uh, like we consider when we think only of Bernoulli's law. It also curves. Um, so in order to have that curve, uh, it must be true that at the entrance there, uh, the inside, the, the Chan the center line of the, uh, uh, of the channel must have a higher pressure uh, than uh, the outside because it curves. Otherwise, it wouldn't curve, right? Uh, that's also Newton's law, which is, by the way, uh, Bernoulli's law framed in a different way. Uh, so that actually helps a little bit. It means that uh, there is a bit of uh, decrease on the boundary layer pressure on that part of this um, diffuser. But then, you know, then uh, you get the reverse curve. You curve inside, which means that you need even more pressure on the outside than on the inside. And the inside was already at high pressure. So this will never work. 
the boundary layer has to uh, work against two types of uh, pressure increase. One from Bernoulli's law, like even if the lines were straight, and two uh, because of this curvature of the air. Um, so this will never work. Now, of course, you can do things. Uh, you can do, for instance, you can say, well, you know, it's a big angle diffuser, like 40 degrees. I'll, I know that I can get away with 7 degrees, so let's put in baffles. Let's make like a parallel number of 7 degree diffusers, and that might work. And it, you know, it sort of works. Uh, but it gives a lot of drag because it's a lot of area there, uh, and a lot of new boundary layer. We can do screens like in a wind tunnel, we can do vanes, we can do vortex generators on the walls, we can do all sorts of ugly things, and, and they've all been done. And they never work very nicely. So then during the Second World War they came up with this idea. Like, so half of this diffuser, uh, the first part is actually okay-ish. Uh, so let's do away with the other half. Uh, we'll just put the radiator there. In wind tunnels, actually, they put a screen there to slow the air down and then make a new boundary layer. Now, we don't want drag, but we have drag. We have a radiator. So we could insert uh, the radiator at that point and never even attempt to make the air turn into the direction of the, of the holes in the radiator. And that's the idea is like if we have a stop sign in the wind, uh, then the air will diverge, right? Uh, it will have a certain type of flow which is diverging, uh, and behind it, it will be horrible, of course. Uh, but there is no behind because we put the radiator there. So this is what it came out. If you do the potential theory calculations and you put sources there and blah, 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 uh, then you will find out that uh, if that, that you know, orange part is your radiator, and if the radiator would have no drag, uh, you, you could have air coming straight in, like uh, the 1.0 in, uh, in this graph means it's full velocity. It goes in, goes out at the same velocity. Uh, if it's not fully uh, blocked, like maybe it's 80% blocked, then you have the next line. If it's 20% blocked, 25% blocked, which is what happens in a radiator, then you get the blue, uh, the darker blue part. And that flow that goes, comes in, and it flows sideways, and then it sort of gets into that radiator at an angle. And because the flow is so curved, actually from the potential theory, you can uh, do the math, and you can find that there is no drag, and that there is no pressure increase on that wall, if you like, on that separation line. So if you put a wall instead of that separation line, you should be fine, right? Uh, it should be possible to do this without boundary layer separation. It's weird because it doesn't look like a decent diffuser at all, and it's also weird because it comes in at an angle uh, and at a high velocity. But, you know, like Kuchemann said in 1942, uh, let's do the research. Let's put it in the wind tunnel. And I haven't been able to find much research on that, but people started using the idea. And you might worry, like, but, but it comes in almost at right angles to the edges of the radiator. That can't be right. That's why we, why we had the S-curve in the first place, right? Um, because instinctively we felt like, yeah, you can't do that. You can't go into a radiator at an angle like that. Turns out you can. Uh, the Americans found out in 1942 that actually if you do it like this, you come in at an angle into a radiator. Of course, a radiator is a bit like a lot of small wings. It has noses which are a bit rounded maybe. Anyway, and the velocities are not that high, so the losses are not that terrible. Uh, turns out that you can have almost no pressure loss, no extra pressure loss from that uh, radiator for inflow angles up to 70 degrees, which is almost, you know, it's not quite right angles, but it's close. So the idea that Kuchemann had, it, it, it almost works. Um, so that's something about the internal uh, diffusers. 
we can get away with internal diffusers if we shape the wall a bit like, uh, the, uh, like the flow that goes into a traffic sign. You know, just diverging and, and trying to get around the corner, but not getting around the corner, it's sucked into the, ra into the radiator. Uh, so that does mean that there has to be a lower pressure uh, after the radiator than before it. Uh, and that is something that you regulate, and that's the sort of like the third lag of this uh, Second World War research. Uh, they found that uh, if you do the, uh, if, you, if you calculate the flow inside the, the diffuser, uh, then uh, if you dimension the whole thing so that on the aft end it, it, it exits with almost you know, atmospheric pressure, uh, there is a rule of thumb that says that uh, as long as uh, the exit is uh, not bigger uh, than the entry hole, the diffuser will not separate. This is a bit like, hmm, okay. Uh, and I, I don't see a real, there are some, you know, equations there, but it's a bit like uh, iffy and uh, I think this is where real, you know, experimentation comes in. Actually, I think that uh, what used to be only uh, wind tunnel research uh, is actually going to be CFD. This is one of the few areas, I think, uh, where CFD is actually better than handbook methods. Uh, this is the only way, I guess, to find out whether uh, what kind of optimum there is between what kind of radiator do you choose, how open is it, how much pressure loss does it have, um, and uh, what kind of diffuser do you, do you take, what kind of shape. Shape is quite critical. What kind of exit flow do you have? Where do you put it on the airplane? Um, people say you should put that exit on the airplane in a place where there is low pressure, like maybe even at the nose of the airplane. You know, they turn the radiator back, they take uh, air in on a place like this with high pressure, then they turn it back and they, they f let the air flow out on the top of the wing or you know, on the nose where there is a, like a suction peak or something. Well, almost anything they tried in that way, it turned out that the increase of the drag of the airplane itself due to spoiling your flow like that is so big that any, any, uh, any advantage uh, inside your uh, heat exchanger is completely lost. So that's not a good idea. You have to have a way, a place which is like sort of harmless uh, to, to exhaust that air uh, and it shouldn't spoil the, uh, the air behind it too much. That is why it's a good idea to have these radiators like in the Messerschmitt 109 uh, at the trailing edge of the wing because there is no airplane aft of that trailing edge so you cannot spoil the boundary layer there. So that's basically good thinking. Um, so that's what I can tell you right now about cooling uh, inlets and, and radiators. Now there are a number of special subjects uh, which I could touch and I'm not sure how many of those I will cover. Uh, the first one I guess is the uh, pipistrel. Uh, it's sort of like uh, an example aircraft for us because it does have a, uh, the, an electric engine, uh, an e electric motor and it does have liquid cooling. Um, so we might have a look at that. So this is the front intake of the pipistrel. And you see that, well, what can we say? It, it looks like it wants to have boundary layer diversion because there is this ridge. On the other hand, it's quite close to the nose of the airplane, so I'm not sure why they do that. But maybe the reason is that they want to go past the, uh, the motor itself and into a lower placed radiator. I think that's the most likely reason. I think boundary layer diversion in this point is, is not really a good idea and of course from a uh, normal flow, airflow streamlining point of view, you would never choose this, uh, this shape for the nose of an airplane. So you pay a high price in terms of outside drag uh, when you do an intake like this. I think I wouldn't do it like this. But, you know, uh, who am I? You should always talk to the designer. They may have, have, an, have given a lot of thought to this intake. And um, so, you know, 
Un until you talk to the designer, you never know what the reasons are for a design and how good those reasons are. Uh, what is definitely bad is the outlet. Uh, what you see here is the typical outlet of uh, what is a piston engine airplane, a light plane. And what they do is uh, they sort of dump the airplane, the air out at the bottom. You know, no people live at the bottom. It's like in cars and people, the bottom is not the nicest part. And uh, so there's oil leaking out and that uh, no one looks at that part. Uh, so usually the bottom of an airplane is an ugly place anyway. It's oil stained and it's, you know, people don't want to kneel down to look there. So, you know, you can get away with nasty things there. And this is a nasty thing uh, because you see that this, uh, this uh, exit is almost like diverging, which means that it will separate. You know, it's, not a, it's not a contraction at all. Uh, and probably, if I know light planes, probably there is a sharp corner at the, the firewall there where the air ha has to go into a right angle from, let's say, flowing more or less down to flowing to the rear, which will also separate. So this whole outlet thing is really, it stinks. Uh, then there is the intake. So th this is the intake for only the cooling of the rear pack of batteries. Now that's a big intake. Uh, and it is on a part of the fuselage which has taper, which is like uh, getting smaller to get quickly to a low uh, diameter and a low um, surface area. So I'm thinking that if I would have designed this airplane, probably that would have been like the highest taper that I could get away with. And now I put a bulge there. This is not going to end well, you know. The intake looks nice enough, uh, although it's big, I think, very big compared to the front intake. Uh, but the bulge is like, you know, very short. And, and you see it here again. You see that bulge ends quite abruptly. It is a bit of a streamlined shape, but hmm, not, not very much. Probably the only reason it's shaped like this is because it's on a hatch. This used to be uh, another type of uh, airplane which didn't have that, uh, that, that battery uh, area to the rear. So I think they probably said, well, we want to keep this inlet restricted to that little part that we have to cut out of the airplane anyway. And, uh, and that is how it came about. And then you see Mark Omert there, actually. He's looking into the bottom of the airplane. I've made some pictures that I didn't show here uh, of that hole. It's where the air exits. And that exit goes down. It's not even streamlined, hardly. It goes down. It doesn't go to the rear, you know. So this exhausts into the, uh, into the air at the bottom of that tail, which is already something which has an old, old boundary layer, which has just been punished by the air and by the, by the wheels and by the, uh, the all sorts of nasty things. So I think, you know, this is going to be very draggy. Uh, and then again, there is computer fans inside that exhaust, so it doesn't flow at all. Uh, tends to think I'm not enthusiastic about this one. Uh, so I think the good news is uh, that if we are going to design uh, air inlets and outlets uh, for the Dragonfly, we can do a lot better. We can do much better than this. Well, I'm just about at the end of the talk. Uh, I could go on about all sorts of details and uh, I suggest that you look those things up for yourself. There is a lot of on internal flow especially, uh, there is a lot of literature. There's not much literature on intakes, not almost no literature on outlets, but there is a lot of uh, literature on, uh, on um, internal ducting, on you know, airco and on wind tunnels. And so that part is not easy, but it's well documented. Uh, maybe there is one war story that I would like to share with you. Uh, some of you may have wondered why I haven't touched on, oops, why I haven't touched on uh, what is called a flush inlet. 
the NACI flush inlet or submerged inlet. You've probably seen them around. You see them on cars, you see them on Formula One racing cars, and, uh, and they seem such a nice idea uh, because they don't protrude into the airflow like a pitot intake does, uh, but they seem like very smooth and, and low drag. Well, low drag they are. Uh, they do not add much drag to the outside of the airplane, but uh, the boundary layer, of course, is ingested into this intake. The reason it has this shape is that it sort of guides the boundary layer to the side and, and around that intake, and then the intake, the air ducks into that intake. And uh, yeah, it's used a lot uh, for places where you don't want to have protrusions and for simple things like uh, cabin ventilation, etc. Um, now, just to, to show you uh, that such things can be risky. Uh, this is my first job uh, as an aircraft engineer was in flight testing, uh, and it was flight testing of the Fokker 50, which is this airplane. Um, I was in, in uh, data acquisition, I was in the hangar, and we were doing these uh, computer uh, um, you know, plots of like 10,000 parameters on this single airplane. It was like 20% of the airplane weight was orange cabling for all sorts of sensors. One of the sensors was a uh, temperature sensor inside the cowling, and that, that intake that you see there is just the intake to ventilate the cowling a little bit. It's not the engine intake, it's not the cooling, it's just a bit of air uh, to keep the in uh, internal temperature of that compartment down. So uh, they put some young engineer, I imagine, uh, on the task, and he came up with this, uh, this, en this, this NACA flush inlet. And no one really thought of it. And then came the first flight. Uh, we did the, uh, the plots, and we found that there was one sensor was off. Uh, it, it showed like 180 degrees centigrade on the firewall inside this cowling. So everyone went like, oh, oh that's, that's another temperature sensor gone wrong. We'll put in a new one for the next flight, and then uh, that will be OK. So we'll put in a new one for the next flight. And, and we recorded it 180 degrees centigrade. This is like, this is a, a plastic cowling. That cowling should have melted. This was impossible. And then people started to think, and they said, well, you know, but when the thing is in landing, because it turned out it was only during the landing, only just before touchdown, the temperature soared up. And then it turned out that someone said, yeah, but just before landing, you have flaps out. You have this massive upflow ahead of the wing. Uh, so then the air comes up, and it actually came up at a 45 degree angle relative to this cowling. Now, an NACI flush inlet can take plus or minus 30 degrees. So the air just went straight over. There was no air coming into that inlet at all during landing. And within like 30 seconds or something, the inside of that cowling uh, became temperature high enough to melt the inside of the cowling. So they had to quickly, quickly, quickly do something about it. What they did is, you can see it on this picture, they tilted that uh, flush inlet like 15 degrees down which meant that at 45 degree upflow, it was just inside the 30 degrees. And, uh, and in high speed flight, uh, when the air came a little bit down, it was still within 30 uh, degrees of angle of the local flow, and that cured the problem. But it could have built, killed people, you know. Uh, actually, that, that whole cowling could have come off uh, if someone hadn't noticed. So this is just a war story uh, to warn you that uh, things are not always uh, what they seem. Well, thank you. <laughs> Mike? Yes, I hope my microphone uh, works now. Yes. So uh, thanks, Pete. Very interesting. I hope the students uh, have something uh, about it as well. Uh, I think so. Um, so I'm actually looking if there are questions in the chat, not yet, actually. So uh, ho I hope there will be some questions later. Um, but in the meantime, there are also a couple of people here in the room. So probably someone has a question here as well. Um, but first, I have a question in the meantime. Sure. 
Um, so you mentioned something, you, you showed a, a picture where the inlet is smaller than the outlet. Yeah. But I was actually wondering, what if you turn it around? So you have a, sma uh, a larger inlet than the diffuser and then a, a smaller, out uh, yeah, smaller outlet. That means that you actually add some momentum or add some, you know, the inlet speed is smaller than the outlet speed. Mm -hmm. But I can imagine that you also stagnate the air a, a little bit. Yeah, it's just I, 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 you add some drag. So how does that work? I have work? to tell you that is why I told you about CFD being maybe the answer to this. Uh, there is a, a very complex interplay between the drag inside the uh, the radiator. I mean, you know, you get you take in air at the front, uh, then you do something to it, something awful in this case. But you can also increase, uh, by putting a jet engine inside, you can increase the, the momentum and the energy of the flow there. And then you exhaust it at the rear again. Uh, now, if it were really true that you have this entrance, which is like, uh, let's just for the sake of the argument say that you'd have the entrance and the exit the same size. Uh, what would happen, uh, it, it almost wouldn't work because uh, it would mean that if you want to exhaust the air at the rear at the same speed that you in take it in at the front, that can only be done if you have no energy loss. So that's sort of impossible. So what's going to happen is that uh, you will have some drag inside that uh, tube and you will have to sort of uh, have this narrower thread of air expanding a bit ahead of that tube Otherwise, it will not come out at the end. There has to be a pressure difference there. Uh, so you, and, but if, it, if it's done like this, even then it will not come out at the same speed that it uh, originally came in. There is going to be loss. It's a complicated thing, actually. It's, uh, it's one of the things that uh, when preparing this, I went like, hmm, actually, I don't think I really got to the bottom of this yet. Uh, there, there's a lot of work to be done, detail work on this flow. Yeah. And that's something uh, you already warned us uh, about in the beginning. It's a difficult topic. Uh, it is, yes. <laughs> Actually, it's much more difficult than designing an airplane. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, one comment from Arturo is, when is the next CFD boundary layer master class from Pete for different heat exchanges, inlet and outlet designs? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you're invited again. Okay. Um, but then a question from uh, Tim. Uh, does the temperature required uh, also play a role in designing the shape and volume of the inlet slash outlet? Yes, it does. Uh, maybe Tim heard of the Meredith effect. Um, it's like this. Uh, if you compare this to a jet engine, well, or even a pulsed jet, or something, uh, a ram jet, uh, then what people can do, what they have done, but you need quite high speeds there. Uh, what you can do is uh, you can take in the air and you can burn it. You can inject fuel into it and burn it, which is what a ramjet does. Uh, and then it exhausts at the end and there is more air, you know, it's hotter. Um, so it's, it, you've added energy and this can add thrust. If you, then you can do what you just suggested. You take in air, you do something to it, but this time you add energy to it and then you exhaust it at the end. Nice. Um, and actually, it's been said that uh, in, the, in airplanes like the Mustang, that they flew so fast and there was so much heat rejected inside the radiator that there was some of this effect. There was actually a bit of thrust from the heat uh, expanding the air uh, in that, uh, in that uh, exit. Some people claimed that the, actual, uh, the, the Mustang actually got thrust instead of drag from uh, from its radiator. Now, if you do the math, it, it cannot be true, but it's definitely something that brought down the drag from that radiator, maybe from 10% to 2% or something. Uh, so yes, yes, that can be done. And uh, another thing is that uh, if you heat up air, it changes the viscosity of the air. And uh, some of these German reports go into that and they claim that uh, if you exhaust air and it hits the bottom of your fuselage, for instance, uh, it will sort of, uh, it I think I remember, which I do not understand, that the air became more viscous relatively. 
and that there was an increase in drag due to the air being hotter there. But I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure it's a minor detail, things like this. What you need to avoid is to spoil the boundary layer on the rest of your airplane. So if you can get away with it, then you should probably have Either you should have a radiator which is in a bulge which is sort of like, like a torpedo hanging below your airplane, or you put it like in the Messerschmitt 109, you put it in the rear of, uh, of the trailing edge of, uh, of the wing and then, <laughs> you know, it's lost. Mm -hmm. uh, do something like that. Don't try to let it hit the, the rest of your airplane because it will, sh it will definitely spoil the boundary layer. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah, and actually, when we are talking about sizing, I had I had a question as well about that because mm -hmm. electric propulsion systems are way more efficient than internal combustion engines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, for example, fifty percent more efficient. Yeah. Um, so that means fifty percent uh, yeah. uh, yeah. less heat. So can you yeah. just say easily like, oh yeah, we uh, just downsize the inlet and the outlet by fifty percent and we're fine? It's quite easy to say that, yeah, um, and it may be partly true, but. I've done the math before and, and recently when I prepared this I found a um, graph which I, I, I didn't insert it, maybe I should have. Uh, it's the heat balance of uh, a right cyclone, I think, engine, an air-cooled engine. And, and then it struck me that uh, on that heat balance, balance you see like there is, you know, uh, heat radiating from the crankcase, there is uh, all sorts of, there is the oil cooler, there is the intercooler, there is all sorts of losses, 2% here, 4% there, 6% there. Uh, and 75% of the loss came out of the exhaust of the engine. Because, you know, that's most of the uh, inefficiency of a piston engine is that it burns uh, and it then it ex expands, uh, but it expands at a pretty high temperature and a pretty high uh, velocity. Actually, one of the things that they did is turn the exhaust tubes to the rear and get some jet thrust from that. And that was more than they got from the radiator. All these airplanes did it, uh, not at the start of the Second World War, but the, at the end of the Second World War. All they, they all had these curved you know, exhaust tubes on the uh, engine itself. Uh, so 75% of that loss is, doesn't have to do anything with cooling coolers uh, or oil coolers or whatever. It's already lost in the exhaust of the engine. Um, so maybe it's not as favorable as you think. But, but still, I think if you have a well-designed um, uh, electric engine, electric motor, it will reject a lot less heat for like 100 kilowatt. Mm -hmm. It will reject a lot less heat than a piston engine, even through the cooler. So I think actually it's one of the reasons I think that the Pipistrel, uh, like, you know, the intake for that battery compartment at the rear, the batteries, they, they dissipate 80, 80 watts. It's, it's almost like it's, it's like a lamp, you know? It's nothing. Uh, and then they have an entrance this big. That can't be true. So, yes, you need to think about sizing. Mm. Okay, thanks. Is there maybe a question in here in the room? Arnold? <coughs> yes, it's um, me standing behind the camera here. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is hearing me. I just turned on my, yes, so my microphone is on. Um, so uh, if you look at the Dragonfly and you look at the front side of the, of the aircraft, yeah. um, and if you like, I can pull up a slide actually, everyone can see what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a, <coughs> a render here yeah. of the Dragonfly. Yeah. Uh, you should be able to see it on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, never mind the propeller, this is still a concept, this is not even a propeller that we're planning on uh, developing. Oh, it's um, a propeller. It, it's, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks Mark for, uh, it's, uh, I think originally it's a three-blade Chesna propeller and Mark made a five-blade propeller out of this, so <laughs> this doesn't even, this is a very imaginary. I especially um, like the big spinner. Exactly, exactly. Um, but if you look, if you look at the, um, uh, the front side, you see the blue part is the batteries, you yeah. see the, the gray part, which are the two motors, so it's a twin configuration, two motors. Mm -hmm. um, we still have to think about placing the, the, the radiator, yep. um, uh, the pump for the cooling, mm -hmm. and some other accessories. Um, so what, tri what trade-off do you think you can consider for designing the inlets and out outlets, and also placement of the radi radiator in, in this configuration? Yeah, well, 
there are all sorts of practical considerations, like you don't want the radiator to be fully at the rear of the airplane because it would make long liquid lines, you know. That's one of the reasons why people put chin radiators at the front, because then, you know, you have the minimum, the minimum liquid line to your radiator, which is, you know, aircraft are, uh, you know, like they say, an aircraft is a collection of compromises fly flying in close formation. And so this is definitely something to be considered. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, if I look at this, uh, I would say be practical. Uh, there is a good place that I can see for a radiator, which is just ahead of the, uh, of the, uh, the uh, firewall. That looks like about the right on the, on the bottom side, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah. and then, um, so then you could have a chin radiator maybe, and, uh, and then a bit of a channel towards that uh, radiator, then have that channel at the last moment expand like uh, the trumpet that, uh, that yeah. was like uh, the stop sign flow. Uh, and then be very careful about how you take that air aft of that radiator outside again. Don't dump it like that, like they do in all these light planes. Dump it into free space there and hope that it gets out through the bottom. Make a nice channel, uh, curve it nicely, maybe do some louvers there to curve the airflow to the rear, or make a nice round, uh, a rounding. Uh, some people make rounded edges on the bottom of the uh, firewall, actually, yeah. to make nice flow there. So that would be, maybe that would be uh, a good place for the thing to be. And does it make sense to uh, stay with the conventional inlet designs for the Dragonfly, for instance, that you've also used in your presentation, the round, um, the round? Uh, I think it's a pitot uh, uh, inlet. Yeah, it should it, it should definitely be a pitot inlet, but it could be flat. It could be like a, a slit, you know. Uh, and and I think the main thing that you have to decide on is uh, whether you need this boundary layer uh, to take off to the side. Yeah. whether it's needed already. If you're completely at the nose, that's the advantage of a nose inlet, is uh, that you don't need that. Um, if you go a little bit more to the rear, uh, you, you even saw it on the Fokker 50, that at the front uh, they had this intake, which also had a bit like, uh, but maybe there were practical reasons for that, it, like it had a de-icing cuff. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't so easy to have a de-icing cuff if it, didn't, if it wasn't a round elliptical thing. There are all sorts of practical reasons to do that. But, you know, I think that uh, having it moderately uh, to the front would probably avoid the need for, for one of these boundary layer bleed-offs. And, uh, and it would not spoil the flow around the nose so much. Um, so maybe a chin inlet or something without yeah. boundary layer bleed-off. Yeah. Then go straight into an expansion. Uh, and I think mainly what racing aircraft do is they always uh, make very small inlets. Uh, of course, they fly fast, so that's cheating. Um, but usually, I think in inlets are too big. Mm. Um, so you should very carefully dimension the size of your inlet. And uh, if it's small enough, then uh, I think uh, a chin inlet might be a good idea. Yeah. Well, I'd rather stick with the uh, one of the first slides that you used in this uh, presentation, which is the Hawker Typhoon, but that's actually my favorite aircraft. So it is. <laughs> because of the inlet. Ah, I see. Well, it is, you know, if you compare the Hawker Typhoon to the Hawker Hurricane, which was the one that came before, yeah. it has this very pointed nose and a belly radiator. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, Sidney Cam was a very practical designer. And uh, the Hurricane uh, had chin radiators when they flew uh, in the Middle East. Uh, they were added to the normal radiators. And I think out of that probably grew uh, this, this chin inlet, this nose inlet of the uh, Typhoon. But the Typhoon was also a different aircraft. It was a, a it's bomber. It's a tech airplane, yes. So it, it, it had to sort of dive, uh, which is a different uh, yeah. flight scenario, I suppose. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. Uh, that yeah. that's All right, that was my right. question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we are actually running out of time for five minutes now, but uh, there is actually one more question from Tel. Mm -hmm. um, at what point would you look at a low-speed inlet and when at the subsonic? Is there a rule of thumb for this or a concrete number when to start to design? Yeah, well, um, the Second World War was just about the changeover between what they call incompressible aerodynamics and, uh, and compressibility, 
uh, and it was point, Mach point 0.8, maybe point 0.7 or something that they reached. And it was only with the jet airplanes that they became faster. Yeah. Uh, and supersonic is totally, it's a totally different story. Everything looks di different, in even Bernoulli's law looks different in supersonic. Uh, so that's, that's not really the issue. But uh, to me, low speed and supersonic, well, you know, low speed, maybe you could say that's a bird or an insect. It has low Reynolds numbers. Well, low Reynolds numbers, they are a problem in themselves because the boundary layers will separate, separate even earlier. Um, so low speed in that sense, like low Reynolds numbers, it makes everything even harder. Uh, subsonic is also low speed, of course, but it's up to m maybe Mach 0.4, Mach 0.6 or something. And that's what we're talking about here. The Second World War was basically a subsonic war uh, in that sense. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry too much about the difference. No. All right. Okay. Well, thanks uh, a lot, uh, Piet. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting. Um, and I learned a lot from it, uh, actually. And I see some people here in the, in the room uh, as well. So uh, thanks a lot. Um, also, there was one comment, comment from Arturo. Thanks for the masterclass. So, uh, and I actually happen to know that they're also working some groups on designing the cooling uh, uh, parts, or, or the cooling part of, of the Dragonfly. So uh, probably uh, they will invite you for, uh, for a discussion later on. Oh, later that, on that, that, that would be great. Uh, it's I learned a lot during preparation of this. And, and the main thing that I learned was a lot of literature from the Second World War from Germany. <laughs> so if they want to have like, uh, if they want to brush up on their German and, uh, and, and they want to learn something about inlets, then I have a couple of articles for them. I could put a list of references here. And uh, there's one American article by Miley, which sort of summarizes the thing for, uh, for, for home builders, you know somewhere in 1965 or something, 85, I don't know. Uh, but the original literature is actually uh, 1940, 1942 German literature. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you already covered a lot to, uh, to start with. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, but there, there's, uh, you don't get away with eyeballing the design in this case. You really have to do the calculations and uh, do the measurements on your radiator. How much is the, you know, how much air comes through your radiator? How, what percentage, what pressure loss, and then you have to design your inlet and your outlet around that. Uh, and that's, I think it's quite hard. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Pete. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, and uh, I hope to see you uh, next time. Yep. Again. Sure. Thanks, Thank everyone at home. Thank you. Bye bye.